1940. June the 4th. And June the 17th. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. Shall I do the blackout, sir, before I go? You was at school in France, sir, wasn't you? It's hard for us to think of them being like us with them talking so funny. But I suppose they are the same, really, sir, aren't they? And fancy if this happened to us. It's the children I'm thinking of. Good night, sir. Yes, I was at school in France. And before my mind could even attempt to take in the catastrophe, I began to remember, oh, all sorts of things. Bits of France that I thought I'd forgotten, but they'd stayed at the back of my mind. Bits of my childhood, as they are bits of the childhood of all of us who have known them. Stones consecrated by a hundred martyrs, by their hands, by the marks of their feet, and even by their blood. And from 1914 to 1918, by our blood. And the newspapers have just shrieked out that France is finished, her heart broken broken up into dust. I feel I must talk to somebody, see somebody. No, it wouldn't make it any better to talk about it, only worse. Books. There's always a blessed escape in books, other countries, the past. There'll be something on these shelves to make one forget. No. Tonight there can be only one country in our thoughts, and we are too obsessed with her present to dwell on her rich history. A survey of the Franco-Prussian War. That would make bitter reading indeed. I was at school in France and everything in this room brings thoughts of other days. Paris. And all sorts of images swim before my mind. A jumble of little forgotten things which at the time seemed so trivial as to be meaningless, but now thought of these trivialities can break your heart. Small forgotten things which in our innocence we thought would last just as they were forever. And for that reason we did not realize that we loved them. But now we realize, we remember, and we love. It was a friendly France, there were no frontiers, no prejudices. The Negro walked these streets holding his head as high as he cared to. And the students of Germany were as welcome here as I was. It was a good place to work, and it was a good place to play. Not the hectic, joyless nightlife of the novelettes, but the true, spontaneous gaieté parisienne, a spirit that made you realize why one French idiom cannot be translated, the expression joie de vivre, a joy as harmless and natural as the wine that they brought to your table. The lights, the food, the drink, the talk, it all spelt civilization. You felt it had always been there, and that it always will be. And then suddenly, and all through the night, my thoughts plunged wildly on, returning always to the Paris I had known. been to bed. Excuse me, sir, but what does betrayal mean exactly? Betrayal? A man in the tube says that's what they've done to us. A betrayal. Who? The French. If he meant they'd done the dirty on us, I don't like that at all. It's like it in some even they're done, isn't it, sir? 
It's the children I'm thinking of, sir. I'll get the paper. For a moment, that suggestion of betrayal seemed too ignoble to be born. Would you believe it? Would you believe it? Would you believe it? And then, it was as if an inspiration suddenly came to me. feeling that the laughter in the streets was stilled forever and that the very stones in the churches were crumbling. But now, there unfolded before me a different vision. One that was to be with me all the months that followed that black day in June. From now on, I thought of another France. The France of the peasant. La campagne française. I reminded myself that here was a French life which, to the rhythm of the seasons, had gone on and on since the days of Charlemagne, a thousand years of French history. I realized with a feeling of growing calm that here is a life that cannot suddenly be cut short by a catastrophe even as great as this one, for it is a life that springs from the roots of nature herself, a life which long before now has survived war, persecution, famine, and bloody revolution. A hundred disasters have failed to jolt the steady swing of the seasons to the temper of which millions and millions of French children have grown up into French patriots, learning to speak the proud tongue of Montaigne and of Victor Hugo, of Molière and of Pasteur, of Marshal Foch and of Joan of Arc. When they are grown up, these are the scenes which they will remember and which will lead them, without further thought, to speak the two syllables, La France. Spring, summer, autumn, winter, that will never change. And as that summer of 1940 changed to autumn, my thoughts were of other autumns I had known. The French Alps, Megève, the moment of complete physical well-being after a day in the snow. And it was the peace of these mountains, strangely enough, that was in my thoughts one night in October, when London was far from peaceful. And I had staying with me, I remember, my charwoman's little grandson who'd been bombed out the night before. You ought to be asleep, my boy. Oh, I know what you mean. It is a bit hard, isn't it? Now, what are we going to do? Now, you sit there. Now, we could have a game of rounders if the room was a bit bigger, couldn't we? I know what we'll do. Have a look at some pictures, shall we? Now. You like looking at the pictures, don't you? Hmm? There. Now, that's a place I haven't been to since I was... Well, since I wasn't much older than you are now. See that? That's a pretty view, isn't it? Hmm? It's the sea, eh? Huh? Who's that? That, my little Londoner, was a youngster as happy and as full of mischief as you are. And you'd have enjoyed seeing all these others parley vooing to each other across the ice and snow as loud as you ever do on Hampstead Heath. It was a happy time when tomorrow seemed to hold for every child a future that was his to shape freely to his own will. And in the warm south, they were having fun too. It was a time when French people seemed to have embraced for themselves and for their children, as we have always done, the gospel of physical fitness, combined with judicious freedom and relaxation, which leads to mental discipline, to well-being, to a life of tolerant happiness, according to the laws of liberté, 
égalité and fraternité. And while all this was going on, my little Londoner, there were other children taking exercise. Children in years, perhaps, but in no other way. They were being robbed of their childhood to prepare them for vandalism. And while others were using their energies to advance the mighty industries of peace, they were preparing for the attack. Well, it had happened before to La Patrie, and each time she had recovered, France was ready. Even the children knew that this was serious. There was work to do, childish things must be put away. But so long as your heart was in the right place, they felt, well, all would end well. They had learnt in their lessons that the French are a stubborn race, and given time, to finira bien. The clouds may gather, but the end will once more be victory this time for good. With God's help, to finira bien. But no. Suddenly, incredibly, the bottom had fallen out of the world. The nightmare was upon them, as terrifying and improbable as if all the crossroads in France had yawned apart in the night and swallowed every French citizen, drawing him down to the bowels of hell. Prisoners in their own country. The phantasmagoria of humiliation before an enemy as hated as he was implacable and cruel. But deep in every Frenchman, even in these, sick at heart as they are, there burns the unquenchable flame of pride. Is there a light in his eye? Rebellion? No, says the voice of reason, leave that to others, younger and stronger, who are watching, watching for the call, waiting to escape. The wine of home tastes sweeter than ever in this company, and the toast is l'avenir de nous deux, the future of Britain and of free France. And so, before our very eyes, the tide began to turn. The martyr hostages of Nantes, of Bordeaux, of Paris. The Syrian campaign. And then there crept through the first letter from French territory, from Edmond's father, to say that he has no news of Edmond since Dunkirk. It made me think of years ago, the Jardin du Luxembourg. Edmond and myself, two little goss sailing toys. And I thought how proud his father will be to hear of him now. For those toy vessels have grown bigger, much bigger. Edmond isn't playing at boats anymore. This time he's in dead earnest. The little French kid I knew has grown up. When he rode stealthily away from his motherland, as if she were some shameful monster which he must at all costs escape, his heart was as heavy as lead. But there was work to do, wheels to revolve, levers to pull, instructions to digest, diagrams to draw, lessons to learn, work. Work for him and for the other exiles, on land, on sea, and in the air. And as the weeks go by, their hearts grow immeasurably lighter for every day brings them nearer to that sacred return to the France that they will love till their dying breath. Work. For one secret minute of every day, perhaps, each of them will stand very still, quite solitary, and think of home, of maman, of papa, grand-père, grand-mère, la petite cousine, the evening meal with its bonne soup, the accordion band that played in the village cafe. But they have only time for one minute of such communing, there is too much else to do. As they drill and march under the orders of their trusted elders, their spirits are high, buoyant with the lightness of a clear conscience. Because the shame of that hideous June, the shame that they had thought for one dread moment would be branded on their foreheads forever, that shame has been washed clean from their young hearts. For they know they are in the right place, on the right path, doing the right work. They know that every turn of every wheel, 
every piece of metal hammered into place, every little mastery of the priceless weapons of intricate machinery, every little conquest in self-discipline, every order sharply obeyed, all these are a step forward. To what? Let the children answer. It's the children I'm thinking of, she said, didn't she? Well, here are the children answering with their eyes. These orphans who so cruelly uprooted could not possibly have known which way to turn, you would have thought. But they do know which way to turn, and that is towards the future. Onward and upward towards... <laughs>